How many times have you driven through a small town and paid no attention to the historical markers? Probably a lot. We've all done it. But for this film, we take a glance into the vast history of Leroy, New York, with the help of some of its various historical markers. In 1793, the firm of Leroy and Bayard purchased 87,000 acres of land known as the Triangle Tract. And this marker here um, represents the southern tip of that tract. In 1801, Ezra Platt and Richard M. Stoddard purchased 500 acres of the tract, which is now completely covered by Leroy, New York. The tract itself was the result of an error made when the mill tract was surveyed by Colonel Hugh Maxwell. The measurements were taken from the Genesee River in Avon, not from the mouth of the Genesee River at Lake Ontario. The mistake ended up taking 87,000 acres from the Native Americans and was corrected when a new survey by Judge Porter took place, and that's how the Triangle Tract was created. In 1797, Charles Wilbur of Rhode Island came to the Leora, New York area in search of wooded lands and streams from financial industry. He found it here in Leroy, New York, and decided to build a crude shack, which he sold a year later to John Ganson, who turned the crude shack into a tavern, which became one of the finest taverns between the Albany, New York, and Buffalo route. Let's go to the site. Here we are at the site of the Ganson Tavern that was founded by Charles Wilbur and Captain John Ganson. Behind me here used to be a log schoolhouse built in 1805, by some of the earliest settlers here in Leroy. So what exactly is the Leroy House? Okay, the Leroy House is the home, it was the home of the Leroy family. Um, prior to it being a, a residence, it was the land office for the Triangle Track. Um, it was enlarged by the Leroy family. Um, they lived in it until about 1837. And then um, it passed on through, you know, other hands. And now, of course, it's a museum. It's owned by the Leroy Historical Society. This house was originally built before 1812 and used as the land office for the Triangle Track. But it was later used as the home for Herman Leroy. So, who was Herman Leroy and his son Jacob? The Leroy family, um, actually the earliest Jacob Leroy, um, came to what was then uh, colonial America in the 1740s into New York City. They were very wealthy merchants. Um, Herman Leroy um, was a partner in a very wealthy and, and profitable um, uh, business known as Leroy Baird and McEvers. And hit, with his business partners, they were in the shipping industry uh, in New York City. Just prior to the uh, Civil War, to the American Revolution, <clears throat> and um, they made, you know, a lot of money from the shipping um, business, and then they started investing in land, and that was when they purchased land actually all over um, the eastern coast. Here at the site of the modern-day post office, there used to be Stoddard and Platt's Pioneer Grist Mill, which was erected in 1803. It was later replaced by Herman Leroy's um, much larger flour mill. It was built here due to the water power of old buttermilk falls, which isn't to be confused with present day buttermilk falls. Where I'm standing now used to be the site of Ingham University, opened by sisters Emily and Mary Yada Ingham. The school used to be called Attica Female Seminary because it was in Attica, New York, but it was moved to this location in 1837. It is now the Woodward Memorial Library, but it used to be the first female university opened in New York State and it used to give degrees in humanities, fine arts, and music. Behind me now is present-day Walcott Street School, which is Leroy's elementary school, but it actually used to be the campus of Ingham University, where 8,000 students attended the school between 1837 and 1892. Here is the grave of Elijah Huftelin in Langworthy Cemetery on Keeney Road. Elijah actually worked for Leroy's conductor on the Underground Railroad, Daniel McDonald. He took care of his horses, and one day he saw McDonald taking four slaves into a wagon, and then they left and never came back. So then Elijah asked McDonald about it, and he confided in him that he was indeed helping slaves cross over into Canada.
From that day on, Elijah often recorded a bunch of the stories of the slaves on the Underground Railroad. This marker says that escaping slaves traveling to Canada used to cross the road at this point. However, that isn't exactly true. The site behind me here is the site of where Jello was produced here in Leroy, New York. The, fact, the original factory was later replaced in the early 1900s by this mission style brick building. All Jello production in Leroy, New York ended in 1964. This is the site of the Woodward Farm, the final resting place of Orna Woodward, owner of Jello, who actually purchased the name and formula from Pearl Wayne. Also, the final resting place of many of his family members, including his son Donald who built the airport out on Asbury Road. All of the Woodwards played a big part in Leroy, New York itself. Where I'm standing now used to be the home of the Donald Woodward Airport, opened on October 12, 1928. It was built by Woodward, the son of Order Woodward, the owner of Jell-O, and it was designed by aviation pioneer Russell Holderman. It was actually known as one of the finest airports in the United States at its time. It was even home to Amelia Earhart's aircraft called Friendship. Amelia herself actually visited the airport in 1929. The airport was later owned by White Airplane Company, which used to assemble planes on site. It is now used by the village of Leroy to house salt and other things. Standing here behind me is a historic Model 91 steam shovel produced by the Marion Steam Shovel Company in Ohio. It is actually thought to be the largest still intact steam shovel in the world. It was used for coring out limestone, which was very popular here in Leroy, as Leroy actually stands on a 150 foot layer of limestone. Much of the limestone actually quarried from the locations around here was used to build buildings actually in Leroy, like the chapel in Max Pala Cemetery. What other historical markers are going to be added? Well, right now we're working on a historic marker that will um, designate the historic district on Main Street, which goes from the Main Street Bridge out to West Main. Um, that is a new designation, and that historic marker um, we're hoping to get installed within the next year. Um, we already have a historic marker that will designate um, the post office, which is already on the National Register, and that will be uh, going in front of the post office. And, um, and we're pursuing the thought that we might be able to get a marker to commemorate um, the woman, the 91-year-old woman whose name I can't remember, who was the first woman to vote um, in uh, 1918 after the New York State passed the suffrage movement. So we got a couple of historic markers we're working on. And there used to be one in front of the Keeney House, right? But... The Keeney Homestead, which is out on West Main Road, um, um, back in, I think, the 1960s, early 1960s, had a historic marker to commemorate the um, uh, influence of the Keeney family, which was quite uh, measurable in this community. And um, Nicholas Keeney, the father, and then Calvin Keeney, who introduced the stringless bean. And the marker was out there. It had been out there for years, and we had it taken down so we could paint it. But it was also at the time that they were talking about building a Walmart out on West Main. So we removed it to the thought that maybe we might get lost. And um, and then when we came to put it back in place, we found out the um, State Department of Transportation would not allow the sign to go back up because it was on their um, uh, right of way. So we're trying to find a, another location for that. Um, and then, of course, the, the other funny thing is the fact that there is a historic marker commemorating the Underground Railroad and where it crossed on Route 5 west of town and that was inadvertently put up in the wrong spot so we're trying to get that moved to a more correct spot too but again we have to work with the DOT to, to get that taken care of. As you can see Leary has a ton of history to be proud of however we only took a brief glance into the history we only looked at the 18th century through the 20th century before that, Native Americans called these lands home, and afterwards, many new businesses came in and took over and reshaped the town. History is continuing to be made here every year, and I look forward to seeing how Leroy reshapes and evolves.